Hello, everyone, and welcome to this evening's Wheaton Conversation with Paola Meninato. Um, I'm Marcy Peterson, and I'm the Marketing Technology Director at Wheaton Arts. I'm a white female in my mid-50s with brown hair and a few highlights, and tonight I'm wearing a patterned shirt to, so that you can help pick me out when I am on. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I recognize that I am broadcasting from southern New Jersey, traditionally the land of the Lenai Lenape. I want to take a moment to highlight the program, the project, excuse me, that um, brought us here and brought Paula to Wheaton Arts. And this two-year project is called the Reflections and Expressions Project, and it's through the Folklife Center at Wheaton Arts. It focuses on the cultural heritage and the, of Central and South American communities in our area through two years of a multifaceted of multifaceted programming that includes exhibitions, educational activities, artist residencies, conferences, rituals, music, and dance performances. I'd love to hear from those of you that are new to this series, and please let us know how you heard about this program this evening. Um, for a technical touch on the technical, I uh, will be I will be moderating and monitoring the chat throughout the program for your technical and general questions. Should you lose connection for any reason, simply close down your windows, go back to that email, and you'll be able to join in again by clicking on that link. You may have noticed the sessions being recorded, and that will just be the panelists and the moderator that will be on on the recording. You will be able to ask questions of Paula through the Q&A feature. And at the end of the talk, uh, Pam will be answering those questions in from the Q&A. So be sure to make this an interactive experience and think of questions as you're listening. Briefly, I want to touch on three great ways to support Wheaton Arts and programs like this. Uh, one is through membership, one is through donations, and the other is shopwheatonarts.org. Um, by purchasing, you are supporting the artists that we represent as well as Wheaton Arts. Next up on our schedule of, um, or, or one of the next uh, Wheaton conversations, and that's the one that has to do with this project will be Music of Argentina, November 18th, and that is with Carlos Pavan. Join us for a narrated com concert and conversation with internationally known musician and composer Carlos Pavan to explore a new approach to classical guitar. In his music, Pavan creates, combines, excuse me, Argentine tango and folk dance rhythms with jazz harmonies and classical techniques. I'll be sharing the link to that Wheaton conversation in the chat. It's my pleasure now to introduce our moderator, Pam Wakeman, Director of Education and Artist Services at Wheaton Arts. Pam will moderate your questions, as I mentioned, in the, that you drop in the Q&A window. Um, at the end of the presentation, she will share those questions with Paula. Please help us make this interactive. Over to you, Pam. Thank you. Thanks, Marcy. Hi, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here with you tonight and to be back into the Wheaton Arts Conversation Program. As Marcy mentioned, I am Pamela Wakeman, the Director of Education and Artist Services at Wheaton Arts. I'm a white female in my mid-30s with long brown hair and blue eyes. Tonight, I am wearing a black and white striped shirt. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I also recognize I am broadcasting from Southern New Jersey, traditionally the land of the Lenny Lenape. I'm very happy to introduce our speaker, Paola Meninato. Paola is a Philadelphia-based artist and activist. She graduated with an MA from Plymouth College of Art, where she focused on practice-led research on how art can dismantle cognitive barriers that enable systemic oppression, and from Tyler School of Art with a BFA in painting, with academic honors, a presidential scholarship, and a solo show at the Argentine Embassy in Washington, DC. In 2017, Meninato published Blueprint for Creative Descent, 
She has given over 250 presentations to over 6,500 attendees on animal rights, political organizing, and creative activism in Luxembourg, Barcelona, Vienna, London, Brighton, Berlin, Sweden, and the US. In 2019, Paula organized a panel discussion and pop-up exhibition, Beyond Raising Awareness, at Tate Modern via the Tate Exchange Program at Plymouth College of Art. As Marcy mentioned earlier, I invite you, our audience, to use the Q&A feature to ask questions. As those questions come in, I will sift through them um, and I will pose those questions to Paula at the appropriate time during her presentation. If you see that your um, question is marked as already answered or will be answered, uh, please know that I, I am seeing them and I, we will get to them as soon as we can. Paula, thank you so much for being here with us this evening. Thank you. All right. Um, I don't know why that is at the very end of the presentation, but let me just go. There we go. Uh, all right. So before I start, I wanted to warn participants that I will be discussing sensitive topics. There won't be any graphic images or overly graphic descriptions, uh, but we will be uh, discussing activist murder, which may be disturbing to some viewers. I also wanted to uh, thank Whedon, especially Pam and Marcy for um, bringing me on here and uh, allowing me to tell these very important stories. So thank you. I'm going to start this presentation by telling the stories, history, and process behind Persistent Memories, my body of work on the Desaparecidos, which is currently at Whedon Arts. After discussing Persistent Memories, I will explain how I incorporate the theories of change and ideas around the psychology of oppression within my creative practice. Persistent Memories is a series of paintings on glass about the Desaparecidos. The Desaparecidos are a series of 30,000 individuals who disappeared during Argentina's military dictatorship, and all of the portraits are enamel, acrylic, and or oil paint on glass. Carlos was disappeared on his way to work in 1977 when he was just 24. He had a wife and a child. Back then, he was a passionate feminist and the type of man who would get up at 4 a.m. to travel to a villa or ghetto and feed the poor. Nora Cortinas, his mother, co-founded Madre de Plaza de Mayo, Línea Fundadora, an organization of mothers that searches for their missing children. He was never found, and she continues to march every Thursday. Alice, a French nun, was one of the original participants of Madre de Plaza de Mayo. As a nun, she did not have her own children, but she believed in advocating for social justice. They protested at Plaza de Mayo in front of Argentina's pink house, knowing that the government could take them at any moment. She disappeared while leaving the Church of Santa Cruz, and her body was never identified. Carlos and Alice are among 30,000 individuals who disappeared during Argentina's military dictatorship. To understand the Argentine military dictatorship and U.S. interventionism in Latin America, we need to start with the Chilean coup. In 1970, Chile democratically elected a socialist president, Salvador Allende, in the middle of the Red Scare. Fearing that Chile would become the next Cuba, the Chilean upper class teamed up with the American military to stage a coup in 1973. General Augusto Pinochet assumed power in a form of a military dictatorship, his dictatorship persecuted leftists, socialists, and political critics. His government illegally detained 130,000 individuals, tortured tens of thousands, and killed approximately 3,000 individuals. Approximately 1,000 people went missing dur during the dictatorship and have never been found. The 1976 coup in Argentina followed the Chilean coup. The justification for the coup was radical extremists who were engaging in violence, but declassified government records tell another story. Less than 10% of detainees were suspected of participating in violent action. Instead, the government per persecuted activists, leftists, community organizers, and even academics who were resisting environmental destruction, the erasure of indigenous communities, and economic policies that concentrated wealth among the upper class while impoverishing the working class. 30,000 individuals disappeared. Babies born in detention were kidnapped and adopted by families sympathetic to the dictatorship. To demand answers to the disappearances of their missing children, the Madres de Plaza de Mayo, or mothers of um, the Plaza de Mayo, organized and marched every week. 
In addition, a sister organization, the Abuelas or Grandmothers of Plaza de Mayo, was established to find their missing appropriated grandchildren. The mothers and grandmothers marched every week, regardless of their circumstances. Even after Alice and a dozen other women were disappeared during, due to their involvement in the group, here they are marching in the rain. Due to their strength, determination, and persistence, the marches organized by the Madres combined with international outrage at the human rights violation paved for the military to step down in 1983, thus ending the dictatorship. My parents attended these marches during the dictatorship. My mother, who was 13, recalls feeling terrified of being detained. My dad's lifelong friend lost both of her parents, Liliana and Eduardo, when she was just a child. Eduardo was a university physics professor who taught his students about the importance of civic engagement. If the dictatorship was really targeting violent extremists, then why did they target university professors, nuns, mothers, fathers, community organizers, sons, and daughters away from their families? 40 years after di the dictatorship ended, the mothers and families of the desaparecidos are still searching for answers. Every Thursday, the Madres and the Abuelas meet at Plaza de Mayo to march. In this photograph, I was with them when I started my research for persistent memories in 2014. While the dictatorship is over, we need to continue fighting for justice. Among other things, family members still don't have answers to their loved ones' disappearances. In 2016, Obama started the Argentina Declassification Project, which released over 5,000 government documents on the Argentine military dictatorship. Within the declassified archives, we learned that the U.S. military intervened in Argentina by supporting the 1976 coup and training military personnel on how to torture civilians. Military dictatorship are not unique to Argentina. Colonialization morphed into interventionism in the 20th century, with the U.S. as a major player, as we can see in this map. Plan Condor was a U.S. organized alliance between the dictatorships in Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, Paraguay, and Uruguay. The organization was operational until 1980, although the U.S. has intervened in other countries since, as shown in this graphic. If you want to learn more about how these dictatorships are related on a global scale, I definitely recommend reading Who Rules the World by Noam Chomsky and The Shock Doctrine by Naomi Klein. Um, Pam will be leaving links to both of those books in the, um, in the chat box. Through portrait, I was able to humanize individuals that are typically viewed as collateral damage. The main reason I wanted to create portraits is that I didn't like how this part of history was portrayed in most sources, especially American textbooks. I felt that the focus was on the facts and not on the individuals or the impacts of their families on their families. Effective organizing relies upon engaging with institutional networks to reach large and or specific constituencies. Um, as we can see in these photographs, Persistent Memories was originally shown at the Embassy of Argentina. By exhibiting at the Embassy of Argentina in Washington, D.C., the exhibition was seen by government officials who participated in the dictatorship. After the exhibition at the embassy, the pieces traveled to Philadelphia City Hall, Tyler School of Art, and Georgian Court University. At Georgian Court, the professors made a huge effort to get students to engage with these works through different assignments. By working within an educational institution, I was able to engage with large number of with a large number of students in a meaningful way that transcended gallery walls. By layering transparent paintings of individuals who disappeared during Argentina's military dictatorship, I hope to spark conversation around the human toll behind post-colonial politics. Glass offers the possibility of multiple layers, offering audience participation through their own reflection. Glass symbolizes the fragility of memory and life. Transparencies engage with the concept of a disappearance by allowing images to fade in and out based on the environment. The individuals are always present even when they are not seen. Through Glass, I hope to capture the invisibility that Latin Americans face as a result of systemic oppression. These are some of the photographs of um, the installation at Whedon Arts, which is available, which is on view now. Um, you can see it up until December 31st.
And here I am. Uh, so you can see the comparison between me and the scale of the paintings. When Latin Americans flee from violence and poverty, which are rooted in colonialism, they are often left with no other choice than to become undocumented immigrants or risk death. These are the eyes of children who died in ICE custody here in the US. They are installed alongside the portraits of the desaparecidos at Whedon Arts. These, uh, while these children were in immigrant detention, um, and while anyone is in immigrant detention in the US, they are awaiting trial to see if they are eligible for asylum. These trials can last years, which means that fa entire families, including children, are living in a cage for years at a time. If you are undocumented and not eligible for asylum um, and you are caught by the government, you are deported. Um, they don't put you in immigrant detention centers uh, for weeks or years at a time. If you're in ineligible for asylum, um, they just go straight to deportation. Um, so none of these families were technically doing anything um, that would be considered breaking the law. They were waiting trials to see if they were eligible for asylum. I created these glass panels at Persistent Memories uh, for the installation at Whedon because I wanted to contrast how Latin Americans are marginalized both in our home countries and when we immigrate. In addition to the physical portraits, I created time-lapse paintings to show how the paintings were created. Through portraits that appear on video, I hope to capture the process behind the paintings while also experimenting with time uh, to see how um, the meaning of the paintings change. Um, now, while these are playing, I wanted to see if anyone had some questions about the presentation. So far, I don't have any questions coming through the chat, but if somebody would like to ask a question at this time, it would be good to type it in and then I can pose that to Paola. Okay, great. Pam, do you have any questions? Yeah, I actually do. Um, you started in the beginning with wonderful, a wonderful way of connecting us to these people and, and their circumstances uh, through storytelling. So first of all, thank you for that. Um, and you shared a story regarding your parents' activism. When did your parents first share the stories of these experiences with you? Um, well, my parents grew up in a military dictatorship, so it's something that uh, was like present um, since I was a child, although um, they started talking more and more about it as I got older because um, I was very involved with um, activism um, and I was very passionate about activism and um, yeah, they felt the need to tell me those stories, one, because they thought um, it should, I, I should keep um, what happened in Argentina, the, the desaparecidos, in mind uh, within my activism, especially since I was doing um, anti-war activism when I first started. Uh, I started doing activism when I was in middle school in 20, I can't even remember the year, it was like 2007 or something, I think. Um, and I would go canvassing and talking to vets about not going on the war and things like that. Uh, yeah. Um, and that, that's when my parents started talking to me about the desaparecidos. Are there other members of your family who are carrying on this tradition that you mentioned of marching or are engaging in civil activism? Uh, some members, uh, mostly my little cousin, he doesn't do that much anymore, um, but he actually went to the church where um, Alice, uh, where, where Alice used to be a nun at, uh, where she was based out of, um, and where she disappeared. Um, so the Church of Santa Cruz is where my little cousin went to Catholic school. Um, and yeah, they taught him about his religion and the importance of, about Catholicism um, and the importance of um, if you're a Christian and if you're going to try to be a religious person, um, that activism should be an important part of that um, and the values of uh, the Ten Commandments. I'm not religious myself, uh, but that is what they believe, uh, that it's the most important thing is to, um, to treat other people well um, and to not kill and to not contribute to systemic injustice. Um, and 
Yeah, and that's why uh, they refused to, the Catholic Church in Argentina did participate in the Argentine military dictatorship, but these women refused to to do that, um, and that's eventually why they were killed, um, is because they were fighting for, uh, for their values and for progressive Christianity um, and for for human rights um so yeah i have um, a process question this is coming from me mm-hmm. um as we're watching these time lapse videos i see that uh you're there's little blips where you're pausing it and obviously you've either come back to it after a day or, or later that day it's not all mm-hmm. one session um how many over the course of how many days are you working on these portraits and about how long does it take you uh to, to complete one of these it depends on the portrait, uh, but it took me months um, of coming back and forth uh, to Whedon um, to do all of these portraits. It was quite a process. Um, I have more of these, but um, uh, so here's a sneak peek of how um, I have a lot of these videos. So there's just two of these, uh, but this is a sneak peek. Um, of how I, of the process behind my work. So I created these special lights out of tinfoil, cardboard, and plastic bags um, to diffuse the light. Uh, That way I could create paintings um, and only so that people would only see the reverse side of the glass. Um, So that way the transparent sections of glass would show up white in the video um, and then you could see how I create paintings again from the reverse side of the glass so you're only seeing the one side, which is not a side of painting. (laughs) (laughs) I have a question from Silvana. They are asking, can you explain why the pieces are hung? Why they're hung? Um, okay. I'm not, I assume that means uh, in the display. Savan, if you could clarify that, but I, I'm taking it to mean in the exhibition. Um, that's an interesting question. Um, what about, because um, I am going to go through the installation later on. Um, mm-hmm. What about, um, can you ask me that question again later on in the presentation sure. Um, sure. with a little bit of clarification? Um, Absolutely. I think. Uh, because I'm going to get to that in a little bit. Uh, so I want to add that to sequentially to another part of the presentation. Um, so now we're going to shift gears and talk about uh, the theory behind artistic activism. Um, so first off, I want to stress the importance of community engagement. Each community is different and has different needs. Um, and you need to connect with uh, the community in a way that's meaningful and build trust over time. Um, so for me to engage with the madres and the abuelas, um, I obviously, I needed to have these conversations with them in Spanish, um, but also show up regularly to the marches um, over a period of time and volunteer um, when I wasn't at the marches um, to, um, actually get to know the community and have them see me as a community member and not somebody that's just, uh, there for a day doing the research, um, and then leaving to go do their project. Um, I've also kept in touch, uh, with some of the family members. Um, and that's really important, uh, because you want to try to have as many, uh, conversations with them as possible, listen to them and understand their needs. Um, so from talking to the families, one of the things uh, that was very important to them is to keep the memories alive um, and to talk about the stories so that this never happens again. Um, right now in the U.S., it's really important to have these conversations uh, because most Americans are unaware about the Argentine military dictatorship or that the U.S. intervened. Um, so finding new and innovative ways to spark discussions through the desaparecidos as, adds new layers to the conversations and hopefully gets uh, this conversation and this period of history to become mainstream knowledge. I think um, every American child should learn about the Argentine military dictatorship in history class. Um, I don't think students should be able to graduate from high school um, without understanding the impact of U.S. interventionism in Latin America. So there's actually a lot that we can do in the U.S. Um, So educating people, educating ourselves, um, making sure that we're learning to, to listen to oppressed communities, 
uh, keeping an eye out for disappearances. And also we can participate in protests around um, local issues, but also at like government buildings like embassies. Uh, so the whole point of community organizing um, is that we're more effective when we're engaging with communities, organizations, and institutional networks instead of trying to do things in our own. As, a, as people living in a society, um, we're interconnected um, and honoring that is very important as an artist within um, a creative practice uh, that seeks to um, engage with systems of oppression. So for me, um, it's very important to consider how my art is situated within larger social justice movements. When we're delivering a message, we need to understand that the person who is receiving a message has a different worldview. So if we want them to be receptive, um, we need to consider that there's more than one perspective in every story. Hence, communication plays a vital role in social transformation. Um, if we want people to listen, we need to honor the fact that their truth um, and their perspective looks very different from ours. We're not going to be able to change a lifetime of living in a society that is entrenched in oppressive and violent ideologies overnight. People rarely change their worldview from engaging with a single work of art. So instead of putting a lot of pressure on artists um, and on community organizers um, and on activists to change the world overnight, uh, we can strive um, for like strive for um, a slower pace of change that we're not like dissolution by the results. So this is the spectrum of allies. Our goal is to neutralize opposition when over neutral individuals and activate allies. Conversations on oppression tend to be difficult to navigate because they bring up feelings of guilt and shame. So engaging with individuals on the opposing side of the spectrum is by far the most challenging. Uh, so the best challenge, the best strategy that I found um, to engage with people who disagree with us is uh, to just illustrate the injustice, appeal to emotion and not to fact, um, and also paint a picture of a better world. Through art, our audience has the opportunity to revisit headline positions in a space for open dialogue. Exploration of new ideas through art may shift individuals from one category to the next. Effective communications, including visual communications, prioritizing conversations and open dialogue over imposing ideologies. Therefore, um, the most effective way to reach people is to start a conversation instead, instead of telling people um, what they should do and what they should believe. Cognitive dissonance is when people hold contradictory beliefs or act in a manner that is inconsistent with their own values and morals. It's critical to recognize when people are engaging in cognitive deflection techniques and in cognitive dissonance because we won't be able to have productive conversations. When people are deflecting, they're probably not going to listen. Um, we may not feel heard um, and they be, may become more resistant to um, talk with us if they feel like we're pushing them to listen. Therefore, the best we can do is to create an environment where people can, safe enough to, can feel safe enough to engage in a conversation and be receptive to our message. Most of the time, people um, don't participate in oppression because they are bad people, or rather because um, it's what they've been taught to do from birth. Um, and it's what they see in their communities. Uh, people will then engage in cognitive dissonance precisely because they care. So the fact that they care is actually the solution um, and means that there is a path towards change. So um, when we're talking to someone, we need to be aware of the fact that most people have already made up their minds and that worldview is shaped by culture and not by facts. Um, usually people will take facts and try to distort them uh, to fit their own narratives. Um, this is called um, 
like, yeah, so this is a, a confirmation bias. So people will, instead of looking at all the information objectively and then drawing from conclusions, most people will go on Google and search up uh, what they believe uh, and then find facts to support that position. Um, and that's actually not, uh, that's not proper research. Um, and it just leads to people confirming what they want to believe instead of looking at uh, the facts objectively. So instead of giving people facts, um, we should focus on how we feel, on the emotions. Um, nobody can tell you that your story is wrong. We also need to honor the fact that um, people are resistant to um, confronting their biases because there is a strong um, impulse that people have to follow the tribe. So if they've grown up in a certain culture where everybody thinks a certain way, um, in back in evolutionary times when people were cavemen um, and cave women, uh, they would um, they felt the need to follow the tribe and to follow whatever it is that other people were doing. Um, so when we're asking people to challenge the ideas that they've uh, believed since uh, since birth, um, we're asking them to and to go against what their community believes. Um, we're asking them to go against some of their basic primitive evolutionary instincts. Um, and in, if we want them to stop dismissing and manipulating information, then we need to find ways of having these conversations in safer and more effective manners. When I was at Plymouth College of Art, um, I researched how to dismantle the psychology of carnism through paint. Um, that was my master's research. Carnism is the ideology that conditions people to eat animals. The violence here is not overtly obvious, um, and the handling of the material is unexpected enough to provoke new questions and thoughts. So I'm not, uh, this is a pig on their way to slaughter, but I'm not just showing you uh, the pig and putting like red paint on it, um, but rather I'm being a little bit more suggestive. That way it's more open-ended. Um, because I'm not here to tell people what they need to think about this. Rather, um, I'm capturing the reality of animal suffering through paint and creating the space for open dialogue. Here's another example. Um, and uh, I'm going to play this other video now. Um, so if anyone has questions about uh, my master's research, we can try to answer one question right now. Um, I do have a question that came through from Ricky. They're asking, have any of the families of the Desperazados been able to see your portrait of their loved one? Not in person, but online, yes. Fantastic. I have a question that um, connects to what you were speaking about earlier when you were describing communities. Mm -hmm. Power of community involvement is clear in the stories that you shared. For those who may want to become involved, are there groups in the United States and or Argentina that you are aware of that are currently organized and operating? Yeah, um, so the Madres de Plaza de Mayo and the Abuelas de Plaza de Mayo are both um, still um, involved in doing this type of work. Um, and then uh, there is a branch of Madres de Plaza de Mayo here in uh, the US. Uh, so um, I can, I don't have their contact information right now, um, but um, you you can look it up. Sorry, that's like the best. Yeah. No, but perhaps um, once this video, we are recording, so once this video is posted on YouTube, we could always post that in the description below the video, links to those yeah. videos. Yeah, so that's where it's going to be in the description link of the video on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> all right, thanks. That's all I have for now. Oh, wait. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, we have a comment. I think there's a question at the end. It says, very well documented presentation on an obscure period in Latin American contemporary history, um, the dictatorships of the South America connoisseur. Do you place yourself as an artist who creates narratives for change through visual metaphors or an activist who utilizes art as a means for dissent and social change? Both. I don't think you need to pick one or the other. Um, Fantastic. Yeah, and actually, I think um, a lot of the time when you think about, um, you know, art for social change, um, sometimes I feel like uh, there's this idea 
of like putting ourselves into a box of what art for social change should be. Um, and that you should just kind of like scribble the message on your artwork. Uh, but I think something like this, uh, where the one that I'm showing you or something like this, like these are pieces on animal testing. Um, that's a little bit more suggestive. I mean, these are still pretty clear and they're still pretty powerful, but I'm not putting a message on it and telling people what to think about it. Um, and I think that, to me is the most powerful way to reach people because people don't want to be preached to. Um, and I think, um, like, I, I think human beings are perfectly capable, um, of looking at the information, um, and forming opinions for themselves. Um, and we also can't tell other people what to do. Um, if we tell other people what to do, I don't know about you, but it, when people tell me what to do, I'm like, no, I'm going to do the exact opposite. <laughs> um, so, but when you give people information and you give them um, the, you don't give them anything to rebel against, that's when they decide uh, that they want to do X or they want to do Y. Uh, and a lot of the time when you appeal to emotion um and when you express like show through painting uh what the animals are going through um or show through portraiture um what uh like try to honor the lives of these people that were killed in the dictatorship um i think that's when people people connect through emotion and that's when they that's when they start to question you know is this right um because when you start debating, it's very easy to get caught up in the facts. But when you're looking at another human being suffering, um, I think most people would choose to do the right thing, um, regardless of where they come from. So, I mean, I believe that when we leave things open um, and when we talk about how we feel instead of talk about just the facts. Um, I think that's where change happens. Um, and yeah, moving forward, I'm going to stop the share for a little bit. Um, so there is a general belief that conversation and logical arguments are better than art at changing hearts and minds. However, existing research on empirical aesthetics suggests that the opposite is true. Art is a superior medium for shifting ideologies. People are actually very resistant to changing their worldview. So um, when people already formed an opinion, which may happen before you even start talking to them, um, they'll generally stop listening. Um, and uh, there is more, there is evidence to support the idea that people are more receptive to information when it is communicated visually. So if when we're illustrating the injustice, instead of telling an audience about it, um, then the audience is more likely to see the message and to hear it before they start deflecting. If they start deflecting at all, they may choose to listen instead. In addition, when people come to conclusions um, and form their own opinions on what the art presents, they're less likely to ignore the message as they might be um, when uh, someone is uh, preaching because they're, they're gonna be more likely to dismiss that person as being preachy. Uh, so yeah, so within my art, um, I don't try to tell people what to think, but instead focus on, um, on the stories and the narratives um, and on um, the effects that they have on actual people. Uh, so images are easier to remember. The picture superiority effect has been heavily researched and states that pictures are easier to remember than words. The graphic illustrates how 65% of people remember a concept after three days when it is explained through text and pictures, as opposed to only 10% when the concept is explained through words alone. Um, and striking uh, and unique works of art are more memorable than conventional images. Um, so uh, yeah, and creating a striking work of art might be as simple um, as uh, using an, a medium in an unconventional way or even using um, a medium in a, in a conventional way, but to um, illustrate a different concept. So people obviously loved uh, looking, love, love looking at paperweights um, and these, paintings on glass. Uh, it, it, these are um, enamel paintings of on cast glass about um, baby chicks 
um, that are killed in uh, the egg industry because they're born male and do not produce eggs. Uh, so by um, using this thick glass, um, I'm able to get people to, I'm able to create images um, and works of art that people will really want to peer into, um, despite the fact that uh, these works of art uh, would otherwise, like if you just looked at the raw images, they would be very difficult to stare at. Um, so by creating artwork, um, I'm engaging the viewer in a different way uh, that they actually want to so they actually want to look at these images. It's important to continue exploring with material textures to create unique works because again, they are more memorable. Um, so I want to show you an example of how by combining glass painting and storytelling, we can engage the viewer. And uh, this is a commission from Collab Arts in uh, New Brunswick, New Jersey. A little bit. It was definitely kind of like a hopeless feeling at first especially because leaving my house due to domestic abuse, I literally just left with the clothes on my back. So for a while, it was just mentally challenging to just kind of accept the fact that this is where I was and that I was leaving everything behind. I kept, I guess, focusing too much on wanting what I left behind in regards to even things like my clothes. I had cats that I had to leave behind. So it was just kind of mentally overwhelming trying to put myself in the present moment. For a long time, I just kind of brushed off my creativity, I guess in a way, wallowing the sadness that I was going through. Honestly, what kind of brought it back was, at first my daughter was the one cheering me up, and then for the first couple weeks, she was really happy about everything. She was kind of like doing a lot of the kind little dances and was thanking everyone saying, thank you for helping my mommy and for keeping my daddy away from her. Then, I don't know what happened, this was prior to COVID, but something just kind of sunk in with her and got her upset. So every night I would draw her little notes or cards. That way when she woke up, she had something special to see before going to school. That's kind of like what got me through that creativity, making her special little cards and pictures. A little bit. Through Glass, I helped tell the story of a woman who fled from domestic violence. In stories of abuse, the survivor often keeps a sense of anonymity to protect themselves. However, when we can't see the survivor, we can't humanize them. By painting the eye, I'm giving the viewer a place to reflect and empathize. Her voice is distorted for privacy, so you can't actually tell who she is. Um, so through art, I hope to reclaim the spaces and voices of individuals who are silenced. I picked this particular quote because I wanted to focus on how incredibly strong Anissa and her daughter are. I also wanted to illustrate the importance of art in overcoming hardships. The gaze represents the idea of seeing the past, observing the present, and looking towards the future. Um, again, so when we're talking about uh, community organizing, we can also look at um, art curation. So um, how we're um, installing the pieces and where we're presenting them, in my opinion, as um, a socially engaged artist, uh, is just as important for creating social change um, as the artwork itself. Uh, so you can have your artwork in your studio and not anyone sees it, um, or you can put your artwork in an in institution um, or an art gallery or a museum or um, an organization where you can reach large groups of people, you can reach policy makers and people in power or targeted audiences so just other artists um, so this was a piece uh, that was installed um, at Tate Modern uh, during uh, the Tate exchange program through Plymouth College of Art um, and so by installing it at Tate Modern uh, I was able to get like literally thousands of people to see it in a day um, and that's the power that museums can have is you're reaching a really large number of people here are some pictures of my showings at the Embassy of um, Argentina. Uh, so uh, I already talked about the one in the Desaparecidos, that's uh, the one on the left. Um, but later on, um, I showed America in 2050, which is picture left. Um, so as you can see, the whole continent um, is underwater by the year 2050. So that's only in 30 years. Uh, that will happen within our lifetimes uh, if global warming keeps on uh, changing, melting the polar ice caps at the, the way that it currently is. And um, I also, um, since America is technically a continent, um, I did the whole 
continent, not just the U.S., um, and also flipped it upside down because we're looking at it from the perspective of a Latin American. Private spaces such as homes and offices are also conducive for deeper conversations. Um, so my dad enjoys the texture in this painting um, and he displays it at his office at Temple University. As a professor, he regularly has conversations with students and other faculty about animal ethics because of the painting, creating the space for conversation without my presence. Um, so I feel like through my art, um, I'm able to get these messages to a lot of people um, without me having to physically go to um, each and every single place, which is what I was doing as an activist when I first started out. Um, so today we went over a brief overview of the concepts around creating social change through art. If you're interested in learning more, I do have an ebook which you can download for free, um, as well as a YouTube channel, which is more information. Uh, Pam will be putting links in the chat if you want to go and check those out. If you do want to support my work, uh, you can consider commissioning art, following me on social media. Um, I have uh, an Instagram and YouTube. You can also friend request me on LinkedIn and Facebook, but I don't really, I'm not as active on those as Instagram and YouTube. Um, and then you can sign up for my email list. Uh, which again will also be in the uh, little chat box, um, or you can uh, share my socials and uh, help more people see my work. Um, I am currently looking, uh, I'm working to um, create some glass cat heads at Whedon. So those will be available for sale um, as well as uh, little glass kitties. Um, so if you're interested in purchasing one of those, it will be available for sale soon. Um, and you can, uh, pre-order them, um, and, uh, have even your own custom glass cat head made or glass cat kitten. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that's all. There's my email right there. Um, and now we're going to open it up uh, back up for questions. Thank you, Paula. Uh, it was fantastic to see these images. I, had the privilege of coming and visiting you a few times, a handful of times, and having some really nice conversations with you while you were in residence at Wheaton. And it was just a pleasure to see it come full circle and to see the installation. Uh, I did not receive clarification on that one question, but perhaps you can talk a little bit about um, your decision-making process and why you landed on having them hung the way you did in the room and the orientation of them in, in that display. Yeah, um, so I um, I wanted to them to be suspended in space. Um, that way as people, because uh, with the original exhibition, they were just up against the wall. Um, but with the glass, I wanted uh, the portraits to fade in and out based on the environment. Um, so as you move, uh, you lose sight of the paintings. Um, and then um, as you keep moving, uh, you see them again. Um, so I wanted uh, the portraits to be able to see, be seen at some times and not be seen at others. Um, yeah. So that's why I installed them um, and hung them in within the space in the way that I did. Great. Well, I have one more question for you. Um, I will give everybody a little reminder that if you have a question, please uh, pose it now by typing it into the Q&A feature. Uh, you can access that uh, by going to the bottom of your screen. It's the uh, third one in from the left or fourth one in from the left. You'll see a little Q&A uh, icon with speech bubbles. So my question has a little bit to do um, about looking at the bodies of work and, and kind of taking a step back. Uh, you shared with us today um, kind of two main bodies of work, if I'm getting that correctly, uh, that seem to be centered on activism. And that seems to me to be a uniting thread between the two. Did one body of work precede the other uh, and do the two bodies of work influence each other in some way? Um. So uh, I started with the pieces of the Desaparecidos. Um, that one did was uh, the first one. Um, I, I started that one in 24, well, started the research on it in 2014 and started the portraits in 2015. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then I got, uh, after my opening at the embassy, I took a little bit of a break from that one. Um, did the animal ethics pieces. I did those from 2017 
to 20 yeah, like up until now. Um, and then this past year, I've been focusing on uh, creating the pieces on um, the Desaparecidos again. Um, so 2020, 2021, I was working on the, what was the other question? Uh, do they influence each other? Yeah, I definitely feel like they influence each other. Um, I think the one, the pieces on the... Uh, the animal ethics pieces influenced uh, the pieces on the desaparecidos more than the other way around, uh, mm -hmm. mainly because um, that's when I started really learning about um, how, uh, how do you explain it? That's when I started learning about the psychology of oppression. Um, I was looking at uh, Dr. Melanie Joy's research on um the on how people will use cognitive deflection techniques and what are ways to create the space for conversation so by looking at her research um and like applying it through my paintings um i learned a lot about um how to how to how to create the space for conversation through art um mm -hmm. in a way to create conversations that are really difficult to have and once I, yeah, after finishing, well, I haven't really finished that research, but after I, like starting that research, it's really changed the way that I approach my artwork. Um, and now, even if I'm touching, like creating artwork about other political topics, I feel like that research really changes my whole perspective and how I, yeah, how I perceive my role as an artist and an activist. Thank you. We do have a question uh, from an anonymous uh, attendee. They're asking, have you received negative pushback on your work? If so, from what sources and how do you respond to it? Also, what are some of the positives that have developed after people have viewed your work? Um, yeah, so I have received negative feedback. Uh, there, I've received... It depends on the type of work um, I've received. Yeah, like it's been it's been both um, on the desaparecidos. I haven't really. There was one person um, that made a pretty ignorant comment um, in favor of U.S. interventionism um, and in favor of killing people because they're communists. I don't know what people are thinking about that, uh, but most people I haven't that that's been the only person um, and that was like a diehard Trump supporter. Um, everyone else, regardless of political ideology, has been very sympathetic to the cause, um, mainly because it doesn't already fit within their worldview. Um, I've gotten more pushback around the animal ethics pieces. Um, because um, I think people have already made up their minds around that topic, whereas the Argentine military dictatorship doesn't really fit within a specific narrative, uh, or at least people don't think it fits within a specific narrative um, until uh, after they've already learned about it. Uh, so people don't feel the need to like dismiss that information right away, whereas with the animal ethics pieces, um, People are still very receptive, uh, but they, yeah. Um, and, and what are some, can you think of some positives that have developed after people see your work? Or do you know, has anybody approached you afterwards and mentioned something? Yeah, I've had a lot of positive feedback. Um, when I did the exhibition, like every at every opening, I always have people coming up to me um, saying that they resonated with my work. Um, with, uh, the pieces at, uh, the embassy of Argentina, I had a lot of Argentines, uh, who either knew people who disappeared, um, or were like their relatives disappeared, uh, that showed up to their opening to let me know that like, they really, um, resonated, uh, with the portraits, um, especially since they are, they, 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 especially since they felt like the portraits really humanized, this topic. So I got, um, I got a lot of very positive feedback from that. Um, and then also within my animal ethics pieces, I've had a lot of people tell me, um, that, uh, by 
seeing those pieces that they've really changed their ideas um, around um, how they view animal ethics. Um, yeah, I've gotten, I've gotten that feedback a lot of times, much more so um, than the amount of people who um, have gotten defensive um, and hated the pieces. I mean, I've had a couple of those people, but most people are very receptive um, and very open to different information when you leave things a little bit more open-ended. Right, and I, I do think after seeing some of those pieces, when I'm looking at them, I'm thinking that uh, it's, a, it's a very subtle way to provide information that opens the floor for conversation. So I think they're they're powerful in that way. You know, it's not an overt right in your face. You know, this is the horrors that you don't see. It's it's something that you're kind of almost squinting at and saying, wait, what what is that? And then it opens that that, that dialogue uh, yeah. in, in a non confrontational way. So I very much enjoy those pieces for that reason. Thank so you. Thank you. Well, that concludes all the questions that I've received. I'd like to thank you so much for being here with us this evening. And it was an absolute pleasure to get to speak with you again. And I hope to see you at Wheaton in the future. Yeah, thank you. I'll be coming back soon. I'll let you Definitely. know. Definitely, let me know, please. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paula, and thank you everyone for being here. And please make sure that you check out the links that we put in the chat for you and sign up for the next Wheaton Conversations coming up. And Paula's information is listed there. So as she said, that's a way to support her is following her and sharing her information and her artwork. Again, the next conversation coming up is music of Argentina. Good night, everyone. And again, thank you, Paula and Pam. Thank you so much. Bye, and thanks, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me here. And thank you so much for everybody that came. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for everyone for joining us. It was great to see all your, your uh, names. <laughs> Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night.